Hello everyone, my name is Ross McDermott. I'm one of the PGY1 emergency medicine residents here at University Hospitals Cleveland Medical Center. I'm here with Dr. Vicki Noble, who is my wonderful program director. Hey everybody. And we're going to be uh, presenting an ultrasound case uh, of a gentleman who came in in full arrest and kind of show how ultrasound uh, helped our management. So kind of the story with this gentleman, uh, he was brought in by EMS. Uh, he's a 64-year-old male patient. Uh, he had a history of acute on chronic uh, systolic heart failure. Uh, after reviewing his chart after the arrest, I found that he had an ejection fraction of about 35-40%. He was also on four liters of oxygen at home. He had sarcoidosis involving the lungs, uh, stage 3 chronic kidney disease, and uh, hip coronary artery disease with uh, PCI in 2013. Um, so according to the EMS report, when they came in, the patient was last known well 10 to 20 minutes before EMS arrived. Family had found him down upstairs, and no one was quite sure when he went down. In addition to that, he had a 10-minute transport time to the emergency room, so a total of 20 to 30 minutes downtime before arriving at the ED door. Uh, so the CPR got started by EMS in the field. They placed a King Airway on them, and he got two rounds of epinephrine in the field. Their initial rhythm when they had found him uh, was asystole, but that changed to PEA and route to the emergency room. Um, and he was still in PEA with CPR in progress with the Lucas device when he rolled in. So just a little bit about what we did in the emergency department before I get to the ultrasound images. Uh, we exchanged his King Airway for uh, an endotracheal tube. We gave a total of four push doses of epinephrine during his resuscitation before we started an epinephrine drip. We had multiple episodes of ROSC with this gentleman. It occurred almost after every time we gave the epinephrine push doses, but in, during his ROSC episodes, the pulse was weak. He would usually lose the pulse after a couple of minutes. We had to restart CPR. We got a femoral A-line in him uh, a few minutes into the resuscitation. Uh, he had a good waveform initially during his episodes of ROSC, but eventually he had a sustained loss of pulse. Uh, he had lost on the A-line. He had no cardiac activity on ultrasound, and the code was called. So this first image, this was actually during one of this one of these episodes of ROSC. Uh, so this is showing this gentleman's native cardiac contraction. Uh, a couple of things you can notice in here, you know, it seems to be a pretty weak squeeze, although there is organized cardiac activity. You notice if you look at the right ventricle, there's some sludging in the right ventricle. And also if you notice the uh, hepatic or the hepatic vasculature in the near field, you notice there's some sludging, perhaps some air there. So this is, this is a pretty poor uh, prognostic sign that he has this poor forward flow and we're seeing all this sludging. And I have to say, this is one of the more impressive um, examples of that air and um, bubbles within the hepatic vasculars that I've ever seen. Um, it's really detailed. You can actually see the bubbles moving forward and then moving back. Um, and again, like Ross said, it's not a good sign. And this was a this was a second image of that. You know, again during another episode of Ross for him, you can basically see the same thing. There's that sludging in the RV and the hepatic vasculature, and just generally poor cardiac contraction. Although he does have native contractions here, so you know you would expect that he has some sort of uh, pulse at this yeah. point. So here's another image where ultrasound was could have been helpful. Um, so at the beginning of this video, you can see some organized cardiac activity. However, the, we couldn't find a pulse on this gentleman at this point, and uh, you can see towards the end of the video that compressions begin again with the Lucas device. If you notice, especially right as the Lucas device begins uh, giving contractions, there's a pretty significant uh, plural, or, uh, pericardial effusion around this gentleman's heart, likely from the repeated trauma of uh, CPR. And one thing, you know, just in terms of ultrasound-guided CPR, again, when he has organized um, ventricular contractions, probably increasing presser doses or increasing the drip is a better move than doing compressions at this point. And so, you know, moving forward, this is why we're looking to incorporate ultrasound more in our resuscitations because I think this gives some really helpful uh, information in what to do next.
So while compressions were ongoing with the Lucas device, uh, I decided to throw the linear probe on this gentleman's femoral artery just to see if I could get an idea of how well our compressions were uh, producing forward flow. And as you can see, there, there's definitely uh, good compressions and actually good recoil of the artery after each compression, which is important. Um, the coronary arteries fill during diastole, so we want to see a nice recoil to make sure we're getting good coronary perfusion pressure. And then for a little bit more kind of quantitative view, um, I decided to throw the uh, pulse wave Doppler gate on the gentleman's femoral artery. And again, this is during Lucas contraction or Lucas CPR. Um, you can see he's got a good waveform, um, so it seems like the, the Lucas device is delivering good compressions of this gentleman. In contrast to that, uh, this is during one of the episodes of ROSC, so this is his native cardiac activity. You can see that the, the waveform is less organized, uh, it's, it, the amplitude is lower. Now one thing to note, just kind of a technical uh, point here, is that the, the Doppler gate isn't completely aligned with his uh, femoral artery, so we may be getting a little bit, uh, we may be underestimating the, the forward flow, but uh, I think it's pretty clear that this is, this is far inferior to what we were getting with the Lucas device. And then as I said, eventually uh, this, this patient had a sustained uh, loss of pulse. Um, I threw the ultrasound probe on his chest. Uh, you may notice that uh, I did flip the, uh, the leading edge here. However, um, it's pretty clear he's got basically no uh, organized cardiac activity except there's a, a very kind of small quiver at the apex towards the end of this uh, video. And here you can see now the sledging and the coagulopathy is affecting both ventricles. Um, you know, it, it is, um, if you have this kind of appearance within the left ventricle, that's, again, a very poor prognostic sign. And just after, after the code was called, uh, we did get some of our lab results back just to kind of show the, the severe metabolic derangement in this gentleman. Um, so his potassium was elevated at 7.7. There was mild hemolysis, but uh, as we said, and as you can see from his lab, pretty uh, severe kidney disease. And um, you know, I'm not sure if the potassium uh, had contributed to his arrest. Uh, you can see that his troponin was highly elevated uh, over three. This is likely from you know he. We drew these labs after he had had CPR ongoing for probably about 20 minutes. Um, so you know, probably a lot of damage to his. Uh, myocardium at that point. And then again, just to kind of show, um, this guy was pretty far gone, uh, lactate 16.6, which is uh, pretty severely elevated. And that's what's so helpful. You know, PEA can have a whole differential. Um, you know, it's hard to know chicken and the egg here because the lung disease may have caused the arrest and then he had this metabolic disarray or did the disarray cause the arrest and his lung disease kind of augmented that. So it's hard to know.